Hey Calvin, it's a beautiful day outside, there's not a cloud in the sky, it's a Sunday, what are you gonna do? I'm gonna watch Bond films! <sighs> You're a sad man, Calvin. Good evening, Mr. Bond fans. Yes, indeed. On Sunday the 13th of June 2021, I decided that I was going to go full Alan Partridge and have a little Bond marathon, specifically all of the Daniel Craig films in one go. 9am, Doctor No. Break for a pee. Why do this, you might ask? Well, I have been wanting to rewatch the Daniel Craig films for some time now. It's been a little while since I watched all of them all the way through, so I wanted to do something a little bit different. And I'm not much of a movie marathon guy, I have to admit. I certainly did a few back in my student days. But Bond marathons I've never really done. Maybe I watched like a couple in a day before, but I've never sat down and fully dedicated time to watching them as one complete thing. And obviously the Daniel Craig era makes the most sense, with the stories being much more serialized and uh, Quantum of Solace and Spectre both take place not long after the films preceding them, so there is some continuation there, and then it feels like there is going to be some kind of build-up to No Time to Die as Craig's last big one, and I would like to try this marathon again maybe some years in the future when No Time to Die is out and the whole thing can be watched as one, but uh, yeah, I just decided to go ahead and watch Casino Royale through Spectre to see how, if Spectre had been the last Craig film, how would that have worked as just one complete four-film arc? Would it have worked as one complete four-film arc? We're going to be talking about that, because uh, I've definitely got some thoughts, and I definitely came out of this with slightly revised opinions of a couple of these films. Um, we're going to get into it. So, obviously, I started out the marathon with Casino Royale at 16 past 8 in the morning. Now, my main concern here was that it might have been a bit too, a bit too much intensity for a Sunday morning view. Viewing. I love Casino Royale, uh, my appreciation for it increases year on year, and to be honest, coming into it this time, I was worried that I might have a bit of burnout for it, because I did see it quite a lot a few years ago around the Secret Cinema time, because I, I went to Secret Cinema Casino Royale twice, I saw it there twice, uh, and then I saw it like building up to the Secret Cinema, I rewatched it in, in detail so that I could pay attention to some of the details prior to the screening of the film. Uh, so this was the first time that I'd watched it all the way through since then, and it's lost none of its magic. It is just a phenomenal achievement, uh, such a masterpiece, and I, if, if anything, I like it more and more as time goes on. I even found myself welling up at Vesper's death scene. Uh, it, it, it gets me every time. I think it's a hugely powerful emotional moment. Um, really top tier Bond stuff. I, I absolutely adore this film. And despite it being a Sunday morning, it still played incredibly well, so I was pleased about that. It was a great start to the marathon. I finished watching it around 10.41am, uh, and then at 10.48am, factoring in a little break to pop the kettle on, I started with Quantum of Solace. Now, this was the one that I was most looking forward to re-watching, particularly coming immediately after Casino Royale, because in the past, I've kind of described it as just feeling like a coda to Casino Royale, just like the appendix. And certainly in the past, this has not been one of my favourite Bond films. It's often kind of ranked towards the bottom of my list if I was to rank them all in order. But recently, this one has had such a reappraisal and I've seen over the last few months like, a good few videos defending it and pointing out some really great things. Articles, I've read articles about it, again, doing the same thing. and. Uh, really insightful, wonderful analysis that I feel like I've taken a lot from as well. And I was watch I watched some of these videos, and I'm like, oh wow, yeah, no, I, I, right, that makes more sense to me now, knowing that that was the the symbolism behind it, the context behind it, all that kind of stuff. So. I really went into this feeling like I was armed, <laughs> like I was it, like coming immediately after Casino Royale as well, armed with all of this extra sort of contextualizing, uh, I, I sat down to it thinking like, right, this is it, this is me getting the most out of Quantum of Solace, finally. But yes, at 12.33pm, uh, yeah, I still don't gel with it. Um, I'm really happy that this film has a vocal following. I love that every Bond film has a following. Every single Bond film is someone's favourite. Even Never Say Never Again, though I know that's really difficult to believe, but it is, I assure you. And I love that. I love that there is a diversity of opinion in the Bond fandom. And I love that people get really passionate about defending ones that they, you know, championing the underdog, as it were. And really, out of all the Craigs, Quantum of Solace is the one that has been going through its renaissance. Like, 
like I say, it's I, I, I've seen so many reevaluations of it recently, um, and it's all really great, amazing stuff. But I, you know, so many of these reappraisals are so detailed and eloquent and quite poetic in their analysis, and I wish that I could be similarly poetic in explaining why I just don't gel with it. But ultimately, all it comes down to is just that. I don't have fun watching Quantum of Solace. I, I think that the film actually really does excel in terms of Bond's character, and particularly flowing straight on from Casino Royale, I really enjoyed seeing Bond's character story weave its way through these two films. Uh, and obviously Quantum of Solace finds his Quantum of Solace, uh, that's the whole point, dealing with Vesper's death and all of that. And it's really good from that perspective, and I think that Craig himself it, really strong performance, and I really like Camille in it as well. I think Olga Kurylenko is absolutely fantastic, and I like some of the action, uh, some of the action, but overall, and I know that there was the writer's strike around about this time was uh, the, the film was uh, going into production, that really shows, because it feels like, I mean, Daniel Craig and Mark Forster, the director, have been very open about the fact that they were developing the script, like, on set in some cases, and it makes sense then that there is this sort of focus in on Bond's character story. As a result of that, I think that like, the villain is appalling in it. Uh, Dominic Green is a really poor... Uh, all of his villainous entourage, the whole plot with the water, with General Medrano taking over the country and whatever, and it's just like, I don't care about any of this. And I've really appreciated, actually, that some of the analysis that I've seen of it has talked about more how that actually feeds into Bond and Camille's character journeys throughout the film, um, the, the, the villain's plot. But... That, I, I, I just don't enjoy it because ultimately I see General Medrano being tricked into signing this thing about water and stuff and I just don't care, <laughs> I guess, at the end of the day. And Bond and Camille are out to kill Green and Medrano anyway, so I, you know, it's... I know that it has a different meaning by the time we know what the villains are up to and by the time that the um, heroes are out to get their revenge, but... Still, I just... Ugh, nah, it, it bored me senseless. At its very base, a Bond film should be... Well, for me anyway, it should be fun. I should feel entertained, I should feel just happy that I'm watching this, and Quantum of Souls isn't that, and you can say that that's by design. Like, it is supposed to be more dramatic, it's supposed to be more serious, it's supposed to be more emotional than any preceding Bond film, and that's all well and good, but then you have... Uh, congratulations, you've created something that I find very little enjoyment in. 1.01pm and it was lunchtime, and I tried to be relatively Bondian with this. I had Tabasco on poached eggs, salmon, avocado, toast. I know that Ian Fleming was much more of a scrambled eggs guy, but I'm a little bit more of a fan of the poached, so I hope he won't mind too much. At 0102, though, I had to sadly confess that I had no pink champagne to accompany this lunch. But at 1.28pm, it was time for Skyfall. Much like Casino Royale, I sat down to this one wondering if I'd been a bit too overexposed to it in the past. I was definitely on a high with Skyfall around the time that I did my last ranking video where it came number one, and while time has gone on, and I, I, I think Goldeneye would probably be at the top of a ranking video if I were to do it today, um, it's lost none of its magic, actually. I think it's still a cracking bit of entertainment, and uh, seriously, after Quantum of Solace, it felt like a breath of fresh air to have just humour, <laughs> fun in that opening title sequence in particular, to have an action sequence where I'm not... I, the, the geography makes sense by how they've edited and put the thing together. I think it works really well as... because obviously Daniel Craig's, you know, character journey throughout all the films is obviously the most prominent, but uh, as this is kind of the last the last main one with Judy Dench in it as well. It was an interesting wrap-up to, to her character story as well. This whole theme of trust, like, really does run through all of the Daniel Craig films, and I don't know if I picked up on it to such a degree before, but, like, in Casino Royale, M's whole point with Bond seems to be to teach him that, you know, he shouldn't be trusting anyone, basically. I have to know I can trust you, and that you know who to trust. And since I don't know that, I need you out of my sight. You don't trust anyone, do you, James? No. Then you've learnt your lesson. I need to know that I can trust you. He's my agent, and I trust him. You should have trusted me to finish the job. I did get one thing right. 
obviously in Quantum of Solace, she does come around to sort of like, nope, he's my agent and I trust him. And uh, the, the whole kind of... The, the, it always just seems to come down to just have faith in Bond, trust in Bond, Bond is going to do what's right, and that uh, feels somewhat contradictory in Skyfall when it, she ends up dead. Uh, the villain kind of succeeds in his plan. But regardless, uh, Skyfall is one of those films where um, I've seen an awful lot of stuff about the plot holes in it, and I've included <laughs> details of Skyfall plot holes in past videos that I've made as well, but um, I, I, I don't know, it, it's sometimes plot holes can really stick out and bother you if you're not having a good time with a film. Skyfall just runs so well for me that I can just kind of shrug and get over the plot holes. I don't really care that Silver's escape plan is so convoluted and elaborate and it requires a great deal of faith <laughs> to kind of believe that he could pull all of this off. But I think Peter Hunt said something to the effect on one of the uh, Criterion audio commentaries about how so long as you're entertained for a couple of hours, does it really matter if you're heading back from the cinema and the husband turns to the wife and says, oh, it didn't really make any sense, did it? It's like, well, what do you want? You're entertained for a couple of hours, aren't you? So 3.51 p.m., it was the end of Skyfall, and by 4.01 p.m., it was time for Spectre, a film that I previously qualified as my least favourite of the official series, and... Uh, I had people messaging me, uh, <laughs> sort of asking if I was okay, if I was in some kind of hostage situation, because at 6.31pm I tweeted that uh, that might be the most I've ever enjoyed Spectre. And yeah, maybe, you know what, maybe I was just a little bit delirious uh, coming after, you know, at the very end of this marathon, but... It, it, it worked for me more than it ever has done before. And I feel like a good part of that was the context in which I was watching it, because coming at the end of this four film run, like, it's fascinating seeing Daniel Craig's performance change and adapt from film to film. He gives a slightly different performance in each one, and Inspector, he is very much James Bond. That is him doing his Bond performance and it's interesting how he kind of gets there because obviously Casino Royale, he's very much this blunt instrument, Quantum of Solace is so motivated by revenge. Skyfall feels like a kind of a nice bridge and then Spectre, he is just, he's just Bond and I don't think I'd ever fully appreciated that before um, or appreciated the nuance and the difference between his Skyfall and Spectre performances which I'd always kind of just thrown in the same the same bracket together but really they're not there is an evolution there and I think it's actually really well handled really well judged I think also that the element of wrapping everything up that we'd seen in the previous three as Spectre tries to do it the Blofeld's scheme and everything it brings back the Shifra and Quantum and Silver and all that and I've had issues with that in the past, but watching it again in this context, it, it didn't bother me, really. It felt a lot more natural, actually. I was really surprised at that. I thought that when I was going into this, I, I was concerned that Skyfall would actually really stand out from the others from a plot perspective, because it is the one that most works, well, except for Casino Royale, obviously, uh, but that's the first one, so it's kind of different. But of the, of the ones that follow Casino Royale, Skyfall is the one that kind of works on its own. The other two, you definitely need knowledge of previous ones to get the most out of them. And I thought Skyfall would stick out for that purpose. In the end, Quantum of Solace was the one that really stuck out more than the others. I think a big part of it is also tone. I'd never really appreciated the humour of Casino Royale before. I'd often put Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace in the same tonal space. Really not the case. Quantum of Solace is so much more downbeat and so much more uh, angry, I guess, than Casino Royale. Casino Royale has humour, it has moments of levity, and uh, Quantum of Solace had, had, has an attempt at a few gags, even though they really just baffled me. How much longer? I have no idea why that's supposed to be funny. Because the tones of Skyfall and Spectre are relatively similar, I don't know if Spectre just flowed on the goodwill of Skyfall more than Quantum did of Casino Royale because it felt like it was such a such a gear change, really. And I must say that rather than feeling like one whole complete story, 
it did feel like a story of two halves. It feels like there is something missing in the middle when you go from Quantum of Solace to Skyfall, and maybe that is in part due to the fact that, I mean, Quantum of Solace is supposed to take place minutes after the ending of Casino Royale, and Spectre is clearly taking place not that long after Skyfall, Bond following up the lead from Judy Dench's M and everything. It, it, it feels like it feels like that could have been like the week after. I think a little bit longer is intended, but it, it feels like very things are happening very quickly. And it's certainly a big part of that. It surely is that he goes from this blunt instrument of the first two into a more seasoned agent in Skyfall. So seasoned, in fact, that they're like, are you even relevant anymore? And I think it's initially quite jarring, but when you realise that Skyfall isn't Daniel Craig truly becoming Bond until the end, it kind of works in that in that trajectory of character that he grows over. And I think a really big part of that is certainly down to the fact that um, so much of Skyfall is Bond being antiquated and there's this, you know, sort of meta stuff about the franchise and the character in general. And he, does, he has gone from being this young, blunt instrument new to the thing to being like, oh, you're a bit out of step, maybe we don't need you anymore, maybe you're not relevant. But that didn't bother me so much, and I think it was because by the time you get to Spectre, that is him becoming Bond. He doesn't become Bond at the end of Quantum of Solace, he becomes Bond at the end of Skyfall. Which is interesting, and I don't think I've ever really picked up on that before. And that really is my big takeaway from this experience, appreciating Craig's evolution of the character in that way. Evolution of Bond performance is obviously not uncommon. All of the Bonds who have done more than one have some kind of... You, Connery's performance in Goldfinger is different to Doctor No, for instance, Piers Brosnan in Dine of the Day is different to Goldeneye and so on, but often the, the actors aren't given um, much of a, uh, you know, they might become more confident in the part. They're not necessarily given stories to develop over the course of, and Craig's Bond really does, and I think he really nails it. Each film, he's doing different things, he's giving a different kind of performance, and I don't think I ever really fully appreciated that until this watch through. And I think I took a lot more out of Spectre this time. Uh, it's not going to be making any like huge leaps up in my rankings, I don't think, but seeing it in this context really helped, I think. I wasn't, you know, bored by some of the more lethargic action sequence like I normally have been, and I don't know if... Maybe I was just out of my mind to delirious by the end of this. Or maybe my action quota was satisfied by, you know, the previous few films, so by the time we get to Spectre I kind of didn't mind so much. But I think that, as well, if Craig had left it at Spectre, it kind of works. <laughs> like, it, as a story, him going off with Madeline at the end of Spectre, in this sort of, you know, however many hours this was, eight, nine hours, god, however long we spent watching these, that worked. It, 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 it felt an appropriate ending um, for him to just kind of go off on. And I, I think in the past I'd have said that Spectre was actually a really terrible ending for Craig if that had have been his last one. Actually now, I think it, it wraps up things quite nicely. I, yeah, some of the developments of Spectre felt less jarring in this context, and I feel like I have never enjoyed that film more, except perhaps the first time that I um, saw it at the cinema. I should probably point out too that I'm not making these positive Spectre statements under duress, I am totally making this of my free will, though I know long-time viewers of this channel may be baffled by this. And even with knowing, I still really think that him leaving Blofeld alive at the end on that bridge, I hate that scene. But knowing that that character is going to be coming back in No Time to Die, that, you know, I, I, I can kind of look past some of my grievances with that scene and look forward to what's going to come in the future. As I say, this marathon kind of felt like it was of two halves, like Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace exist in their own thing and Skyfall and Spectre exist in their own. Probably because Quantum of Solace comes so immediately after Casino Royale and Spectre and Skyfall have that 
a creative continuity with Sam Mendes coming back as director. It feels like it is of one piece. I'll be really curious to know how No Time to Die fits into this when it comes out. If that is going to kind of wrap everything up together, or if that is going to feel like like a third act, really, to this story. If Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace is the first act, Skyfall Inspector is the second, is No Time to Die the big third act of, 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 of this story? Or will it just feel like it carries on a bit more seamlessly from Skyfall and Spectre? I, I'm very curious to know how this is gonna pan out. And like I say, I actually quite look forward to doing a marathon of all five of them, maybe in a couple of years or so, when No Time to Die has really had time to, to settle into the rankings. So those are all of my main thoughts on this uh, marathon. Like I say, I'm not much of a movie marathon guy, so this was something that I don't normally do, and I feel like I got a lot out of it. Have you ever done anything similar when it comes to Bond films? I'd be curious to hear from people who have done it for different eras of Bond. I don't know if it would work for something like Pierce Brosnan, for instance, where each film is so of its own. I'm curious to know how it would work for, like, you know, the first seven. Obviously, the Spectre tangent kind of runs through all of them. Uh, I don't know if I'll be doing that any day soon. It's hard work doing these marathons, even though I love Bond films, obviously. It... It, yeah, I got a little bit stressed about the timekeeping aspects of it. Uh, please do let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. Also below, you can subscribe to this channel as well. Please do that if you'd like to stay up to date on future video uploads. And then there is my Facebook page, my Twitter page, and my Patreon page. So please do head over to those sites and uh, follow me on them if you care to do so. And with all that being said, and until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.